So here we are today, a great pleasure to be here for this quite imaginative and ambitious Navigating Our Business History Symposium hosted by the State Library of Queensland. It's an initiative of the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame, the State Library of Queensland, QUT Business School and the Queensland Library Foundation. So the aim today is to explore why Queensland's business history matters and how we as a community can engage with it and value this history and use it really constructively. How do we have a creative conversation around business and not make it a mechanistic story? We'll also, go, we'll also discuss the importance of collecting and sharing business records, which is part and parcel of this, and how to use the records to better propagate the notion of a shared history. I was once told in my early years of reporting on business uh, matters uh, in WA and then uh, broader that the best business stories were never written because legally they weren't allowed to be <laughs> written. And I do wonder, I've been thinking about it quite a lot in preparation for this symposium, whether that has bedeviled this arena, but that we might leave that as a, um, as, as a little rhetorical question hanging over us. Now, our speakers today um, encounter business history and intersect with it in a range of ways. We're going to hear stories, above all stories, lovely narrative tales, and how business history is implicitly linked with so many aspects of society. And there'll be many opportunities for discussion and several Q&As, which I think will be really uh, enlightening. So two sessions today, the first this morning with Professor Geoffrey Bolton and our first panel. We'll then break for lunch around about 12.30 and then we'll hear from uh, the Smithsonian's Dr Davis, David Allison in a second panel presentation this afternoon. So a lot to come. And I don't know where it's all going to head, if you know what I mean, which is rather nice. Sometimes you, you feel very confident uh, as a, well, sort of confident, you know, settled as, a, as a, uh, an MC in a day. You think, yes, I think I know where it's all going to go. But I don't exactly know today, which I think is lovely. So first, though, I'd like to introduce Professor Emeritus uh, Roland Sussex to address us, to give the opening address. He's chair of the Library Board of Queensland. He's Emeritus Professor of Applied Language Studies at the University of Queensland, and he was made a member of the Order of Australia last year for his services to the development and understanding of languages in Australia. Since uh, 1997, Rowley's been a regular radio broadcaster on language for ABC and commercial radio, and contributes to newspapers and other media on issues of language in Australia. And Rolly's going to speak to us for seven to ten minutes. I just heard him say to somebody, are we going to be savage on time? And I said, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I won't be too appalling. But I do ask you to welcome Professor Roland Sussex now. Thank you, Geraldine. Before I begin my prepared notes, I should say that it's a pleasure to hear you live for the first time. <laughs> Occasionally I ask on, on my radio programs with the ABC who the listeners think is, are the best users of English in Australia. And Geraldine's name is one of the very few that always comes up. It's a pleasure to listen to you. Anyway, good morning everyone. I'm Rowley Sussex and I'm chair of the Library Board of Queensland. It gives me particular pleasure to welcome you to, uh, today to this Navigating Our Business History Symposium and the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame. As Geraldine mentioned, today's symposium is part of the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame, a partnership between QUT Business School, State Library of Queensland, and the Queensland Library Foundation. The Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame was established in 2009 to recognise the public contribution made by leaders of business to the reputation of Queensland and its economic and social development. The Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame celebrates records and retells the past and present stories of outstanding Queensland business leaders, leading businesses and their contribution to our state. Each year, a selection of these outstanding businesses, business leaders of our state are inducted into the Hall of Fame, which is on level four of the State Library in the John Oxley, and I encourage you to explore it for yourself. The Hall of Fame shares business insight through a slate of programs, including Game Changers, a series of conversations with entrepreneurs, 
The final talk in this series is on tonight at State Library with Graham Screw Turner, founder of Flight Center. Geraldine will provide you with more details about this later on. As business records are a collection feature of the John Oxley, it's appropriate that we're here today at State Library to discuss Queensland's diverse business history. In fact, some of John Oxley Library's earliest records are from pastoralists, the mining sector and tourism, revealing the strong representation of business from the early days of the collection. Business has come a long way, and Queensland is now one of the leading economies of the Pacific. One of the goals of the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame is to acquire relevant business records that strengthen and widen the story of business in Queensland. The library collects and preserves Queensland's documentary heritage, Queensland memory, which includes the business, commercial and economic records of all our cities, towns and communities. The John Oxley Library is a rich source of unique materials, including materials never meant for publication, that provide a personal, organisational and business account of life in Queensland. This includes manuscripts, business records, pictures and oral history, often the only account of an event or activity. It's for this reason that State Library not only collects business records, but also encourages and assists organisations from all over the state to value and preserve their own records. Together, we are co-creating Queensland memory. And in the spirit of co-creation, the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame a Governing Committee has established the Queensland Business History Award, which will be presented at the annual induction dinner in July. This award will be presented to a Queensland business that has demonstrated great record-keeping practices and a commitment to valuing its own history. The Queensland Business History Award aims to encourage businesses to preserve Queensland's memory for future generations. The value of a collection is in its use. With this in mind, a Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame Fellowship will commence in January 2014. This fellowship will offer a six-month residency in the John Oxley Library and will contribute to the creation of new knowledge about Queensland's economic and business history. If you're interested in exploring and sharing Queensland's business history, please make sure you apply next year. But for today, we will be hearing about and discussing why business history matters, and the value of engaging with and interpreting business history. On behalf of the partners in the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame, QUT Business School, State Library of Queensland, and the Queensland Library Foundation, I thank everyone for being here today and for showing an interest in exploring our shared history. Thank you. Very impressively short. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like now to welcome with great pleasure our first keynote speaker for today, Emeritus Professor Geoffrey Bolton. He is one of Australia's most eminent uh, historians and prominent socio-political commentators over many years. He's authored many books, he's contributed to many more. He's a fellow of the Royal Historical Society in London, of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia, of the Australian Academy of the Humanities, and of the Royal West Australian Historical Society. He has been awarded an officer in the Order of Australia way back in 1984, which gives you some sort of indication, uh, recognising even then his distinguished service to Australia uh, in education and a centenary medal in 2001 for services to the centenary of Federation celebrations in WA. Now, in recognition of his major contribution to Australian history in the community, he was named the WA Australian of the Year in 2006, and at a very personal note, he was my history professor uh, at the University of Western Australia way back. I was a terribly average student, but he always pretends that I wasn't, but I was. But it certainly changed my life, and I mean that. And I think his hallmark is the drama that he consistently sees, sometimes epic drama, in what many of the rest of us dismiss as just everyday Australian suburban life. Um, I love his ambition about that. I think it's one of his great contributions and I applaud him for it. Um, and I welcome him now to talk to us about business history and its role in our national life. Professor Bolton. Well, thank you.
thank you very much. I have two pleasures, of course. One is that this is not the first time recently that Geraldine has chaired an affair in which I've been involved, and um, she's a very good chair indeed, and I'm delighted to let's keep this up. And the other is that having spent some time at the University of Queensland, I'm delighted to be back in this environment and among many old friends. So thank you for having me. Now, I've called this paper The Quest for Queensland Business History. When I accepted the invitation to speak here this morning, one of my first actions, predictably enough, was to search out Australian business history on Google. I was considerably surprised to discover that almost all the entries on it are primarily works of economic history. Unlike, for instance, American business history or Canadian business history, where the character of the discipline is quite distinctive. There is a site entitled Queensland Business History, but the useful items in it are almost entirely consisting of the productions of this organisation. As I researched further, it began to occur to me that Australian business history, as a separate branch of learning, made a promising start in the 1950s and the 1960s only to be swallowed up by economic history. Since that time, it hasn't managed to disentangle itself entirely, so that your initiative in Queensland has something of the nature of a pioneering character. At the risk of boring you with a twice-told story, let me share with you what I found out. The Herodotus of business history is acknowledged to be the Canadian-born Norman Scott Brian Grah, born 1884, died 1956, who, beginning as an economic historian, accepted appointment to a chair in the Harvard Business School in 1927. In his previous appointment at the University of Minnesota, he took a prominent part in establishing the Business History Society, which from 1926 published a bulletin <clears throat> that evolved in 1954 into the Business History Review. Until his retirement, shortly before his death, Gra published extensively and laid the foundations for an archival collection. His major publication is held to be a casebook in American business history, co-authored with Henrietta Larson and published in 1939. Like many pioneers, he has been criticised for spreading himself too thin and for shortcomings in theoretical rigour. This was to some extent remedied by his successor, Alfred Chandler, born 1918 and died 2007, who injected management theory into the discipline and whose masterpiece was The Visible Hand, The Managerial Revolution in American Business, published 1977. It took a considerable time for the repercussions of these developments to be felt in Australia. Australian universities modelled themselves much more closely on British traditions than on American influences, and the British were slow to admit business history to academic respectability. Even in North America, there was some resistance to business history from those who thought that the depression of the 1930s had exposed the hollowness in the capitalist system. It has been argued that it took the coming of post-war prosperity to bring about the uh, renewed interest and a kind of perspective on business history. As Herman Kruse put it, and I quote him, the businessman is no longer the personification of villainy, he has not been restored to a place among the angels, but he is certainly back among the choir boys. <coughs> <laughs> so it was that in the United Kingdom in the 1950s, although Oxford and Cambridge continued resolutely to ignore the upstart discipline, regional universities in communities with a strong industrial background were more venturesome. Foremost among the pioneers were Liverpool and Glasgow. It was at Liverpool in 1958 that the British publication Business History was launched. It was nevertheless a Cambridge don, Charles Wilson, who in 1954 published the first two volumes of a groundbreaking history of Unilever that uh, set the standard for business history in the United Kingdom. 
a third volume followed in 1968. In this study of a great Anglo-Dutch corporation, Wilson showed a sure touch in disentangling the international ramifications of its activities, but he also presented the English founder of the firm, <coughs> William Lever, Viscount Leverhulme, as a model of successful and benevolent entrepreneurship. Like a good Cambridge Don, however, Wilson disliked being stereotyped as a specialist, and he showed little interest in developing a systematic methodology of business history or in building up the discipline in Cambridge. <coughs> when Australian business history began to establish itself on secure foundations, it owed little to Oxbridge. By the 1950s, there were already Australian scholars who were moving into business history. They had little to build on from the early 20th century. One might look for foundations in the massive commemorative tomes that were a feature of that period, such as J.S. Batty's Cyclopedia of Western Australia from 1913, or M.J. Fox's, splendidly entitled, The History of Queensland, an Historical and Commercial Review, Descriptive and Biographical Facts, Figures and, <laughs> this is all part of the title, and Illustrations, and Epitome of Progress, 1923. <laughs> in such works, one can find historical accounts of the rise and progress of many urban and rural businesses. Although inclusion was usually accompanied by this payment of a significant fee, <laughs> so that the articles tended to reveal an uncritical epitome of progress, the material is not without its usefulness for the modern historian, but one can scarcely claim it as the forerunner of an academic discipline. Seeking for the ancestry of business history in Australia, we should not forget to pay a respectful nod to Sir Timothy Coghlan's four-volume work, Labour and Industry in Australia, published in 1918, with its sturdy statistical foundations. We should also note that between the two world wars, some firms were commissioning histories. For want of academic practitioners, they usually turn to an experienced journalist with some reputation for literary quality. Thus, Ambrose Pratt produced a biography of Sidney Meyer, and Roy Bridges wrote From Silver to Steel, The Romance of BHP, published in 1920. In Queensland, H.C. Perry's Memoirs of the Honourable Sir Robert Philp, 1923, included material about the rise of Burns Philp and Company, in the eyes of a judicious critic, David Merritt, one of the best of the genre was George Taylor's Ma Making It Happen, The Rise of Sir Macpherson Robertson, 1934. This study of a confectionery magnate showed the role of technology, purchasing, marketing, good relations with workers, and organization building. Most, however, fell short of that standard. Economic history sprang to life in 1930 with the publication of An Economic History of Australia by Edward Shan. To this day, it remains one of the most lucid and elegant pieces of historical writing ever produced in Australia. But it suffered from the disadvantage of challenging several of the political orthodoxies of the day. The author, a foundation professor at the University of Western Australia, had absorbed many of the values of that state. He queried the value of much government intervention. He had his doubts about the industrial arbitration system and questioned, especially, the protective tariffs that shielded the manufacturers of Victoria and New South Wales, but bore hard on the primary producers of Queensland and Western Australia. His work came under challenge from the radical nationalist historians who emerged from the 1930s depression, of whom the foremost was Brian Fitzpatrick. They saw the influence of overseas capitalists, mostly British, as exercising a malign influence on the welfare of the working class. If they were drawn to the study of business history, it was to show the pernicious effects of monopoly capitalism. Until the 1950s, Undergraduates studying Australian history, at that minority of universities that taught Australian history, 
were invited to consider the contrasting views of Shan and Fitzpatrick, but without much impetus towards the study of business history. The breakthrough in bringing business history to the fore was the achievement of the young Geoffrey Blaney. Blaney was a student of the Department of History in the University of Melbourne in its Halkian years. His fellow students included figures such as Geoffrey Searle, John Mulvaney, Ian Turner, and his teachers, Max Crawford and Manning Clark. His opportunity came when Professor Crawford was asked to find a historian to write the history of the Mount Lyle Mining and Railway Company. The initiative came from Walter Bassett, a consulting engineer who was a director of the company, and his wife, Marnie Bassett, who was a well-regarded historian. Blaney found that he had a zest and a talent for narrative. He was adept at explaining the technicalities of mining to the lay reader, and he showed a keen interest in human character, whether at the level of management or the working miner. But his instinctive sympathy sometimes faltered at the trade union movement. The Peaks of Lyle, published 1954, established his reputation. Other commitments followed, including a history of Johns and Waygood in 1956, Gold and Paper, a history of the National Bank of Australia in 1958, and Mines in the Spinifex in 1960, a history of Mount Isa Mines. In between, he wrote a centenary history of the University of Melbourne and a history of the suburb of Camberwell. Probably no other Australian historian has made such a brilliant debut. His achievement is all the more remarkable because for several years he worked as a freelance without institutional support until his appointment at the University of Melbourne, first as senior lecturer and then as professor of economic history. In an era less obsessed with credentials than our own, it did not matter that he had no postgraduate degree. In a paper given in 1955, Blaney considered the future of Australian business history. He identified two motives that impelled firms to commission the writing of their history, curiosity and publicity. Of publicity-driven histories, he wrote that they were largely exercises in self-promotion, and I quote him, this praise is mostly written by a journalist in the unmistakable ink of the sponsoring company. He spends the least possible time in research and tries to make the story as readable as possible. These judgments were bland and the analysis superficial. On the other hand, said Blaney, if companies are old and large and confident, they will as a rule not be perturbed if a study of their past reveals blunders and mistakes and a ripple of scandal. They will argue that their own success is proof that these lapses were the exception. <clears throat> now Blaney's experience had already given him insight into the tension between the author's right to exercise independence of judgment and the commissioning firm's desire for a product that would enhance rather than diminish its reputation. One of his histories was in fact withheld from publication from the company that commissioned it and he was not the last historian to experience this fate. Blaney felt for the most part that such issues could not be secured in a contract, but could be resolved by civilized discussion between the historian and the company. He gave an example, and I quote, I once wrote of an industrialist that he rarely visited the works and did not know a spanner from a steeplejack. His successor sent back at the manuscript with a penciled suggestion. He had a capacity for delegation not shared by many of our modern believers. <laughs> <coughs> Blaney in Melbourne in the 1950s was something of a solitary worker. Perhaps because many of his peers had taken the more conventional path to, for an aspiring historian that led to postgraduate research mostly at Oxford, Cambridge, and London. It was the University of Sydney that in those same years took the lead in pioneering business history as an academic discipline. 
The main drivers of this development were two recent arrivals from the United Kingdom. Alan Birch, senior lecturer in economic history, and the Scottish David Macmillan, who became the university archivist. They were encouraged by the professor of economics, Sidney Butlin, who had been commissioned to write the two volumes on, on the war economy in the official history of Australia during the Second World War, and who would himself turn aside from that project to write a history, the Australia and New Zealand Bank, published 1961. It was probably through Butlin that Birch and Macmillan were enabled to make contacts among prominent members of the business community in Sydney, identifying a number who were receptive to the idea of promoting business history. In 1954, the Business Archives Council of Australia was formed with a mixed committee of businessmen and academics. The president, Sir Norman Nock, a successful retailer who had been Lord Mayor of Sydney at the time of the sesquicentenary celebrations of 1938, gave an inaugural address that set out the council's agenda, and I quote him. Its aim is to further that rapprochement between the academic and the businessman by giving news of the council's activities, plans for further development, and of research in business history. Its bulletin will provide an opportunity for the discussion of problems mutual to the company executive and to the scholar. There are many problems, it should be emphasised, not only arising from the research worker's interest in documents, which are commonly regarded as being of no concern or value to outsiders, there are also problems due to the modern officer's frightening capacity to churn out mountains of paper records. <coughs> the Council believes that the world of practical affairs, such as agriculture, industry and commerce, is not divided by a chasm from the universities. The executive and the economist, the secretary and the historian, share a common ground of interest and can help each other in bringing enlightenment in the discussion of economic problems. Well, the first edition of the bulletin duly appeared in 1955. Its contents included an article by Sir Charles Lloyd-Jones on the history of David Jones Limited. And this might have suggested that in future issues, con contributions would be forthcoming from business leaders as well as from academics. But this did not happen. There was also a review of Charles Wilson's history of Unilever, in which the reviewer noted that Wilson had been confronted by an archive of 30,000 files, some of them containing up to 100 letters. Perhaps this information was meant to invite speculation that in Australia there might be similar rich archival hordes awaiting a dauntless researcher. It might be thought that the Business Archives Council had been launched at a propitious moment, for in 1957, the Menzies government received the Murray Report that led to the golden age of university expansion. In such conditions, room might be found for the growth of business history in universities. For a few years, of uh, everything seemed rosy. A branch of the Business Archives Council was established in Melbourne. The early issues of the Bulletin of the Business Archives Council saw a lively debate about future directions for business history. Alan Birch sensed that the subject was still suspect because it was associated with controversial or dubious characters in history, such as John MacArthur or John Wren. In Labour History, and the Australian journal of that name was launched by Labour historians in 1961, <laughs> employers such as the coal mine owner John Brown and the agricultural machinery manufacturer H.V. Mackay were portrayed as the bitterest enemies of the working class. Birch also wondered whether the business history in Australia was inhibited by the prominent role of the state in regulating and even in establishing industries. <coughs> From the University of Queensland, Helen Hughes, whose death was reported a few days ago, I fear, Helen Hughes took a more robust line. She wrote, and I quote her, there is probably no field of contemporary historical writing so formidably dull as business history. <laughs> Economic history, she said, 
dealt with the movements of resources, capital and labor, usually at a regional or a national level. Business history involved, and I quote her, the conduct of men's minds and practice and performance and should consider the process by which talent is attracted into or repelled from the field of business. She commended the question raised by an American writer, D.H. Saul. Are business history and economic his theory compatible? As we shall see, her article raised questions which soon had a bearing on the direction taken by business history. The Australian National University and the University of Melbourne each started to build up an archive of business records under the custodianship of a qualified archivist, Bruce Shields in Canberra and Frank Strawn in Sydney, Melbourne. The ANU collection included the copious papers of the Australian Agricultural Company and of the pastoral firm Goldsboro Mort. On this basis, Alan Barnard was enabled to publish one of the first sophisticated business biographies, Visions and Profits, Studies in the Business Career of Thomas Sutcliffe Mort, published 1961. As its title suggested, it was not much concerned with the private life of Mort, but traced his entrepreneurial and marketing activities in the 19th century pastoral industry. From the Australian National University also, Margaret Stephen produced Merchant Campbell, 1965, an important study of the first generation of Australian commerce in New South Wales. The Australian National University also saw the rise of Noel Butlin, younger brother of Sid Butlin, but strikingly different <coughs> in his methodological approach. Noel Butlin held that economic history must be founded on a strong statistical basis. He and his team devoted several years to amassing a number of publications, bringing together statistics from colonial, state and commonwealth yearbooks and many other sources. They traced patterns of investment, production, private and government expenditure, migration and industrial growth over the period from 1861 to 1939. Some critics questioned whether too much faith might be placed in 19th century statistics such as estimates of sheep and cattle numbers provided by outback graziers to semi-literate police constables. <laughs> Others, such as John Larnose, himself, Shan Star pupil and a historian of economic thought, um, commented that if Butlin was asked to write a history of religion, it would be entitled Churches, Capital Formation. <laughs> <coughs> but Butlin's magisterial findings caused all Australian historians to rethink their ideas about, for instance, the importance of housing investment in the late 19th century and the sources of finance for industrial growth. They also helped to pave the way for a more economic econometric approach to the discipline of economics and hence of business history. Side by side with academic growth, business firms were still commissioning histories by professional journalists and these continued to be of mixed quality. The Colonial Sugar Refining Company sponsored a publication, South Pacific Enterprise, published 1956, which was neither a history nor a work of propaganda Edited by A.G. Lowndes, president of the Australian Institute of Political Science, it was the work of a number of contributors. It included several chapters of the firm's history in Australia and Fiji, but also contained material about marketing, technology, and agricultural practice. There were also morsels for the social historian. Readers were informed that until 1936, the firm made a practice of not employing women and that in what was then the present day, the 1950s, employees were not permitted to smoke during office hours, in which CSR showed itself to be either well behind the times or well ahead of them. Most of the commissioned works were open to Blaney's criticism that they told a good story at the expense of critical insight. <laughs> Among the more memorable, might be named Colin Simpson's History of Ampol, Show Me a Mountain, published 1962, and Alan Marshall's attempt at a second biography of Sidney Meyer, distinguished with, by what we would now consider an inappropriate title of The Gay Provider. <laughs> <coughs> it was not surprising that business firms turned to respected journalists 
for their histories, as few young graduates in history were showing much interest in following in Blaney's footsteps. During the same period, a change came over the Business Archives Council in Sydney. Perhaps this was partly due to the loss of two or three of its most influential supporters in the business world. Sir Charles Lloyd Jones died in 1958. Sir Norman Nock was absorbed by many competing claims on his time, as well as overseeing the expansion of the family firm into the suburbs. His interests included commercial television. He served for 15 years as president of the National Roads and Motors Association, and he was entangled in the downfall of the large electrical chain H.G. Palmer Consolidated Limited. This left the academics to take over responsibility for the bulletin of the Business Archives Council. In 1962, it was transformed into the Australian Economic History Review, and in 1966, control passed to the Department of Economics at the University of Sydney. The council's role was diminished to providing information about archiving, and it gradually faded out of existence. Its successor, the Economic and Business History Society of Australia and New Zealand, appears, in the words of Helen Gregory, to concentrate more on economic history than on business history. The Australian Economic History Review survives to this day, but its content was moving in directions that, that did not favour an emphasis on business history. It has been written of S.J. Butland in the 1960s, and I quote, he preferred to work within a literary framework and to practice as an economic historian preferences that did not sit easy with the growing formalism and mathematical trends of the discipline. Geoffrey Blaney resolved the problem by branching out into broader themes, making two major contributions to Australian historical writing, In the Rush That Never Ended, 1963, and The Tyranny of Distance, 1966. From the Chair of Economic History at the University of Melbourne, he moved to the mainstream Department of History. Economic history was nevertheless still flourishing as an undergraduate subject in Australian universities, the number of students growing from 800 to over 2,000 in the five years from 1961 to 1966. The great days of growth of university funding ended with the Whitlam government. It was followed by a period of stability under the Fraser and Early Hawke governments, and then by the Dawkins Revolution of 1988 89, which ushered in the present period of increased Canberra control, diminishing government input into university funding and a misguided competition policy. Although schools of business studies were among the more flourishing university disciplines, this did not lead to a marked expansion of business history. This was possibly because the uh, courses attracted a large number of overseas students whose education did not need to include the study of the Australian past, or perhaps of history at all. University academics, encouraged to seek funding from non-government sources, turned more readily to accepting commissions to serve, write the history of businesses, including non-government organisations and philanthropic bodies. At the same time, there came into being a class of professional historians, often with qualifications that would have earned them a university post in the 1960s, who now made their living, as the young Blaney had done, by undertaking to write commissioned histories. Queensland provides an example of this process. Until the appointment of a state archivist in 1959, the source materials for the state's history were scattered and largely uncatalogued. Unlike some states, Queensland had not legislated to ensure that one copy of every newspaper should be lodged with the State Library or the Parliamentary Library, and the files of some important regional journals have been lost entirely. At the University of Queensland, the dominant head of the Department of History for 30 years after 1949 was Professor Gordon Greenwood, whose strengths lay largely in the fields of diplomatic and political history. Early academic studies of Queensland business history tended to emanate from outside the state. Blaney's Minds in the Spinifex, for instance, or David Macmillan's pastoral history, Bowen Downs, 1863-1963, or somewhat later, Ken Buckley and Chris Cugman's history of Burns Filt. Greenwood's coadjutor and successor, Malcolm Thomas, 
and a senior member of his department, Ross Johnston, both able and respected historians, proved more receptive than Greenwood to the opportunities presented by business history. Thomas was the author of Rocky Point and the Heck Family, A Hundred Years of Sugar Milling in Southeast Queensland in 1979, and From SGIO to Suncorp, 1896. Johnston, a generous collaborator, included among his publications Hindsights, a History of a Timber Family in Queensland, 1980, and co-authored co with a member of the Hind family, and uh, You Can't Make It Rain, the story of the North Australian Pastoral Company, 1877 to 1991, co-authored with Dr. Margaret Kovold. Other university staff who contributed to the field were Alan Lockheed, the Brisbane Stock Exchange, 1984, and from the University of Southern Queensland, Morris French's A Century of Homemaking, A History of the Toowoomba Permanent Building Society, 1979. Their work has been reinforced by the publications of a number of respected professional historians. Ruth Kerr, a major figure in mining history, whose works included Mount Morgan Gold, Copper and Oil, 1982, co-authored with her husband John. Freedom of Contract, a history of the United Graziers Association of Queensland, 1990. And John Moffat of Irvinbank, 2000. Zeta Denon published TYSON 2002, a study of a 19th century pastoral baron, and Lorna MacDonald covered Rockhampton. So there has been a good deal of creditable business history produced in Queensland, inside and outside the universities, and yet the overall impression is one of a piecemeal and fragmented approach. Everywhere in Australia, the story's the same. Queensland is no worse than the other states and has been rather more proactive than my own state of Western Australia. Opportunities are seized when an enlightened management grows aware of the need to tell the story of the firm, or when the approach of a milestone such as a centenary stimulates the urge for celebration. But until now, there has been little in the way of a coordinated approach, still less of the sense of mutually supportive collective energy on the scale apparent among business historians in the late 1950s and early 1960s. <clears throat> Borrowing unashamedly, not for the first time in our careers, from the thorough research work of Ellen, Helen Gregory, we can see that the provision of business history in Australian universities is at best patchy. Australia can boast two veteran practitioners in David Merritt at the University of Melbourne and Simon Villay at the University of Wollongong and some significant activity at the University of South Australia. But beyond that, there is not a great deal more. I don't know why business history has fallen into such disfavour, but a few guesses may be hazarded. <coughs> Five minutes to go. First, the past quarter of a century has been a time of contraction in Australian universities, and the establishment of new disciplines is not easy unless they offer some obvious commercial value. A young Blaney in the early 21st century who tried his luck at freelancing for commissioned histories would have a burden of hex debt in his saddlebags. <laughs> Although business schools are many, they concentrate on contemporary problems and practice in management and marketing, and on the whole are not habituated to a long-term historical perspective. A number of Australian firms have become absorbed into multinational conglomerations and this perhaps lessens the incentive to record their achievements for posterity. Fashions have changed in Australian historical writing. Fewer young Australian postgraduates are interested in political or diplomatic history, perhaps because they savour too much of the great man in history. And this could extend to studies in business entrepreneurship. Young historians are more inclined to want to write about racism, feminism, social welfare or popular culture. There are not many fierce young Marxists who would write business history from a critical or even hostile point of view, and it's doubtful if they would get much of a hearing. When the veteran Humphrey McQueen published a major critique of the Coca-Cola empire, Essence of Capitalism, 2003, it went almost unnoticed by Australian reviewers. Neither the foes nor the friends of Australian business show great passion for writing its history. 
So, in the words of that famous Marxist Vladimir Lenin, what must be done? <laughs> For a start, we might politely disentangle business history from economic history. Helen Hughes's definition should guide us here. Business history is about people, about the conduct of minds and practice and performance. It lends itself to lively and compelling narrative. There is still the danger, as Doug Munro put it in a review of Buckley and Copeland's History of Burns Filt, that, and I quote him, company sponsorship of their own histories have tended to result in a somewhat sanitised account, not as a consequence of direct censorship imposed by the companies, but through a subtle process of self-censorship. But that is the problem met in many kinds of history. Blaney's recommendation of honest dialogue between the historian and the firm won't always solve the problem, but in my experience, it may go a long way towards a satisfactory outcome. In Western Australia recently, David Huff, a professional historian who had not previously attempted business history, produced a history of Bowens Limited, which for the first three quarters of the 20th century was the major locally owned emporium in Perth until taken over by the Maya Group. The takeover was both the result and the precipitant of a rift within the Bowen family. Huff found that the discussions of the past that took place helped to bring about reconciliation in the family. It is good to know that the book sold more than 6,000 copies and formed the basis of a doctorate in philosophy. It is heartening to witness the initiative taken by the John Oxley Library and the recommendations for accessing and utilising the collection's key stories and themes. I haven't left time for the implications of the computer revolution of the last two decades, since the problems of business history are the common problems of all systems of record keeping, not least the tendency of data to be lost in obsolete retrieval systems. I'm sure that the staff of the John Oxley Library are more competent than myself to ensure the standardization of databases and the widest possible access to materials. We might draw on our digital resources to compile what might be called two hit lists. One would draw attention to the collections of existing archives which could provide material for a worthwhile publication which has not yet been explored. The other would list the topics in Queensland business history that are crying out for early attention so that priority might be given to searching out the research materials. There remains the question of how to encourage the writing of more and better business history. Here I might venture to suggest an idea on which we've been working in my own university, Murdoch. Murdoch University celebrates its 50th anniversary in 2025, and no doubt a history will be written. Many of the founding mothers and fathers of the university are still alive and in good shape. But in the nature of things, it can't be expected they will still be around when a historian begins work sometime in the early 2020s. We have, therefore, set up an ambitious oral history program, gathering the reminiscences of as many of us as possible of the surviving eyewitnesses. We can't afford to transcribe them all immediately, but we can make sure that the interviewer provides a precy of the major points made, together with a timeline. And in this way, the researcher will begin with a useful accumulation of the voices of the past, instead of having to start from scratch. This is a practice that many businesses and organisations might be encouraged to follow. Those interviewed should include not only the policy makers and the senior managers, but also the trade union representatives, the personal assistants and secretaries, always extremely knowledgeable, even the office boys and the tea ladies, if any such can be found. By putting these stories on the record now, a firm foundation will be established for the business histories of the future. And when paper records are being discarded, don't let, it, it, don't let any so-called hard-headed realist send all that stuff to the tip. <laughs> let the archivists see them first. And if the archivists are overworked, then at least let a historian be consulted who can advise whether on first glance the material seems worth considering for preservation. To conclude, the friends of business history need to blow their trumpet, <laughs> loudly. Let them educate the managers of businesses and sporting clubs and charities and NGOs 
into realising that they are part of history and they have a responsibility to history. Let them use the new technologies to ensure that the storage and dissemination of material continues to become easier than ever has been before. And let them proclaim everywhere in Australia that even in the toughest of times, it is possible to build bridges between the academy and the business community, not merely because the business community is seen as a source of philanthropy, but because it has been and is an integral part of the Australian story, and that part of the story has not yet been told adequately. You in Queensland are giving a lead. The rest of us should follow. Yeah, I'll, sit. I'll do that. Yeah. Um, we'll see what we can do. Whether I sit there before I call, no, I'll stand here. Um, but Geoffrey, that was absolutely fabulous and um, really thought provoking in your lovely wide coverage. So thank you very, very much indeed. We have about half an hour before we go to morning tea, and um, I'd like you to join in, and I will kick off if. Uh, we've got two mics, have we? Yes. Uh, if you'd just say who you are, please. So who would like to um, either challenge Jeffrey's in, uh, thesis or uh, add to it? Um, I can certainly carry on. Um, if I will, in the, in, unless you wave at me. Oh, yes, right over here. Yes, please. <laughs> just coming down behind you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Can you hear me? Is that yes. it? working? Right. Your kind words. <laughs> May I just add, a, uh, you mentioned my hindsight, which I did with Lambert Hine, a timber history of Hine and Son in Meriburra. There's been a very good recent timber history done by Shirley Lay, who died last year, of the Lay family, L-A-H-E-Y, and the Lays were the ones who really got Canungra going and then they had a big mill at Sherwood and up in North Queensland and even out in Fiji. Now, although it's really a family... Well, she conceived it as a family history, there's an immense amount of business history in it. There's no way, and as, as you were saying and, and drawing upon Helen Hughes, there's no way... Well, one should incorporate the people and the family as well as the business side of it, and Shirley does that very well. So I'd like that to be added to the list of memorable Queensland history writings that have come out so far. But thank you very much for that... Good broad coverage from worldwide, Australia and Queensland. Very good. Oh, thank you, Ross. Yes. Any other...? Um... I was just struck, Geoffrey, by the dilemma you raise about, say, Ed Shan, um, that he wrote this beautiful, elegant overview, but he ran foul of the political orthodoxies uh, of the day, and, and maybe that sidelined it. And I just was thinking that that was a very interesting... Um, sort of pothole, set of potholes that could be, could maybe to be avoided in order to make sure that you don't enter the controversies of the day and get judged by that volatility of you know look what we're living through. So I just sort of wonder if you can if you can imagine sort of covering the the business history um, without it straying into the either the economic. Uh, uh, d debate or the political debate? Is, is that a way forward? I don't believe you can segregate them entirely. Am I audible? Because yeah. I'm quite yeah. comfortable sitting down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that you can segregate them entirely, but I think it is possible to tell a story from the viewpoint of the firm and its policy makers involved um, without necessarily implying that that was the only way of looking at things. Um, if I might take an <coughs> example, for the, in recent years I've been taking far too long over writing a biography of Sir Paul Haslack, who was a diplomat and a historian and a governor general and a cabinet minister, and responsible for a number of quite contentious areas of policy, such as Papua New Guinea and Aboriginal policy, not to mention the Vietnam War. And um, I believe it's my task to present the reader with as sensitive and as honest a picture as I can of the motives which in each case impelled Hazlitt to favour particular policies 
Uh, well, at the same time, acknowledging that there were critics. Um, overall, I have to say, I've honestly come to the point of view that Hazlitt was more often on the side of the angels, or at least of the choir boys, than, than, uh, than he was not. But um, I think a firm of, as Blaney says, which is established and confident, will allow those discordant voices to be heard as long as they don't drown out the main narrative. Mm. Uh, see, it also struck me as you were speaking, uh, I wondered whether, in fact, the, the secret is, is not to go too narrow. Could one not argue that it's vital to set it, these in a wider context so that you do draw in the, 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 the community, that almost you almost seduce the community into thinking we're not just telling the story of a business house or a family or whatever, that you are very much setting it in that wider sociological context. I mean, that, could that not be another way to go? To sneak in, in a way, mm. via the side door? Look, it's obvious that the Queensland of today is a different place from the Queensland which I came to in 1989. And that was a different Queensland from the Queensland that had been at the end of 40 years of Labor government in 1957. And that was a different Queensland from the Queensland of McElrath and Griffith. You've, you have to set the context and you have to let the reader of the 21st century remember that other eras had other mindsets, other sets of values, and that it is uh, anachronistic and wrong to evaluate the decisions taken, let us say, by a cane farmer in the 19th century or a small businessman in the 20th century by the criteria of today. Um, you may feel that these standards have been shown to be misguided and have to be discarded, but you have to treat older generations at least as if they had good intentions. I'm actually sort of even saying something. I'm wondering whether, in effect, when you do your biography of Hasluck, whether you've also got to nod to um, the interests of a lot of you, as you were saying, of the historians of the today, which will choose to write women's history, say, or whatever. In other words, I'm wondering whether you've got... whether the way to get around this sense that it's too narrow is to observably also know what the lady in the corner store and her daughter are earning at the mm. same time. You know, that's what I mean. Whether you actually... Uh, whether you, you, you just ob observably put people in a broader context. Well, I think if you can do that, that, that's extremely valuable. You have to guard against the risk of diffuseness, of uh, yes. running into too much um, background detail. But um, certainly, I think, if you're writing the history of a well, again, a sugar refining ca factory, then it's worth knowing who owned the corner store opposite where the workers went and bought their pie and coffee and what mm -hmm. sort of earnings they made, what was the spin-off for the town. And uh, I think all that's pretty relevant. Mm. Yes, please. Have we got a... <laughs> you can probably just shout, I think, yes. Here it comes. Jeanette Wright from the State Library and, and uh, Geoffrey, it was, it's very pleasing to hear that, that, um, that we're leading in this, uh, in this endeavour with the business school at QUT. Um, but one of the things about the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame and just in my short time here that I've learned is that many of the, uh, the businesses that we've recognised or acknowledged have actually been driven um, by families. And I think Ross's point is a good one, that the, the families um, have demonstrated values that are relevant to business. And I think really this was one of the ideas behind us building this archive of business history was um, to establish um, a knowledge base of history about how business and leaders are successful. And sometimes it's within that context of a whole family, and sometimes whole families have been recognised in the Hall of Fame. And in a, in a sense, it's a different... Um, it's more about a longitudinal 
history rather than a horizontal history that you were referring to, Geraldine. Mm. But see, you're, Helen, you're, Helen Hughes would say that's formidably dull. Yeah. <laughs> is there any... Is it, you know, honestly? Is that the risk? That's what... That a family... Yes. ..can be dull? I don't think so because I think just as, as many of the family-run businesses, global businesses, you know, they're interesting stories and people are interested in celebrity... But I think you, you, you'll get uh, a lot of context from the values that are coming through generations. And I think, just as you were saying, it's useful to have the, the uh, horizontal perspective of what's going on, what, what's the context of the business success at the time or the failure. But equally, I think it's important to see the longitudinal value. And I, I wondered, Geoffrey, if you have a view about that. Well, you lead me off in about three or four different directions, all of them fascinating. But um, first of all, I obviously we haven't got a business hall of fame in Perth, but we do have an agricultural and pastoral hall of fame that's been going for 10 years or so and which I've been involved with. And I know that one of the difficulties we've come against is with a family such as the Duracs. Now, collectively, they made an enormous impact on the cattle industry in the north of Western Australia. But when you look at them individually, it's a bit difficult to know which of them should be discriminated as the one who needs to be <laughs> memorised. And I think the whole idea of saying, well, there's a family that might be enshrined collectively is one that I'm going to take back and suggest because uh, so far the Duracs have missed out because of that um, question. I think intrinsically that there is no family so boringly conformist, so carbon copy of each other, that there are not uh, dynamics and tensions and, and arguments and differences of perspective in it and um, growth of experience. So that I suspect that a firm that has got a family thread through its narrative is more likely to throw up some interesting and colourful details, perhaps, than, than something a bit more corporate. Uh, I guess one of the other things and that strays a little strictly from the family thing is that you might, on the analogy of what we've experienced with the agricultural people in WA, but you might, for instance, say, well, the Hind family they're certainly profoundly important for Maryborough, but are they profoundly important for Queensland? And, and we've had a lot of trouble mm. discriminating between those who could be seen as having had a statewide impact and those who had had a very great and usually beneficial impact on their own corner of the state, but they might not be household worlds across the way, and, and we're still grappling with that problem. Yeah. Um, just to pick up on a, a couple of points, uh, you made the point about how expensive it is to uh, capture the stories and, <coughs> and transcribe them, and, and it is certainly a very expensive business. Um, and so one of the reasons that, for instance, where we inducted a family, and, and, and there's another family to be inducted this year, is simply because of the economics of it. We try to capture the, the characters as best <coughs> we can within the whole family history and their contribution. Um, in relation to your latter point, um, because Queensland is such a geographically dispersed state, we're looking at um, people who've made significant contributions to particular regions because that's really part of the Queensland character. But more broadly, I'd be just interested in, in your ideas uh, and, and what guidance you might be able to give the governing committee because it's always a struggle for us. We've got about 1,100 names um, that we've identified. Of those, on, on one basis, you could probably say there, there's 150 big stories. And what we're trying to do is to cover the most significant people in each of the eras, in each of the industries, and in each of the regions of Queensland in the for-profit and not-for-profit sectors as, as a way over time of giving a good snapshot of Queensland's uh, business history. And that will take us another 20 years. Mm. <laughs> but that's great. We hope it'll go on forever. But I'd just be interested in any ideas that you might have for us as a governing committee and how we might approach that huge task. 
Well, I think you're on the right lines in the way that you're approaching it, and the fact that you can't cover everything doesn't mean you throw up your hands in despair and do nothing, and inevitably that will lead to some decisions about importance and quality. Queensland, of course, has diversified, decentralised much more than Western Australia, and we just don't have major provincial cities on the scale of Townsville or Rockhampton and, um, you know, Geraldton and Bunbury just don't stack up at the same um, level. So that um, in some respects we have to make the effort to make sure that we're thinking regionally. And it's also obvious that you've been far more successful in trawling for a far greater range of possibilities than has so far been the case with us, and I don't think that Western Australia are orphans, I don't think South Australia or Tasmania are that much further forward. Um, but um, uh, essentially, of course, what we cannot predict is the advances that we made in the storage and preservation of data. We could not be attempting what we're doing now 30 years ago, and we don't know 30 years hence what other tools might have come our way to enable us to process a whole lot of stuff quickly. Um, only the human brain will be left lagging in the rear. But uh, um, all I can say at the moment, but it's a thing I'd like to give some more thought to, is that it sounds to me, Peter, as if you're very much on the, the right lines of doing what can be done with the material. Can I just offer something just before you... I was just thinking of... Um, if you think of that television series Dynasty, <coughs> which was fundamentally about the stories of families, but, uh, and it was highly successful, but it wasn't the story of their business, it was the story of the families. Uh, I'm just, and, um, you know, the, and I see I don't know how it fits in, but you learned about the business sort of, uh, um, in, in the function of learning about the epic drama of the families, but you certainly were taken into the business stories as well. I'm just wondering if that does off and of course it did require families to be immensely candid sometimes you know I don't know how on earth they got people to um, open up the, the wounds that were there yeah. uh, and I, I've often wondered you know about the aftermath of it like with that Holmes Court family <laughs> really I have um, yeah. but it, it, yes I don't know the answer but I just I just would offer that in if with because that's most definitely stories of, you know, timeline, scope, grandeur, epic, and incredibly successful with the Australian public, the broader public. Now, somebody else had, yes. Ruth Kerr, thank you, Geoffrey, for your kind words. I have been working in business history areas since the 1970s. A point that I'd really like to take forward that Geraldine has mentioned and Geoffrey in a different way is that people like me and I know others receive commissions to write histories which are never published mm -hmm. and which for which there is no intention that mm -hmm. they will be published. And the historian receives an appropriate financial consideration for that and very extensive allowance into the family. Because often these histories are where siblings in the new generation in the family business, major businesses, not a public company, are seeking the way forward but are embroiled mm -hmm. in enormous negativity as Geraldine mm -hmm. stated about dynasty. And so I offer that a mention, the success and value of that to the families. It is an enormous healing and reconciliation process is it? Is for it? them. Is it? The ones that I have done oh, has enabled 
exit strategies to be developed for them to understand, to read the other perspective and on occasion to be in the same room. So I state and others who will have experienced the same as I can further work in that area very successfully. So you become a sort of broker in a way between them by telling the story. Thanks. Interesting. And that's both an honour and provides great value to both parties in doing the history. Oh, thank you. And it is yeah. explained and put away in the drawer, so to speak, mm. and the company Closure. <laughs> evolves and continues. Thank so you. I'm very okay. pleased to have worked in that area as well. That, ex yeah, that really parallels and expands and builds on and, and amplifies the story I was telling about David Huff with the Bowen family yes. in Perth. It's, um, really pleased to know that, that he's no orphan, that there are other uh, examples of this sort of process. But it doesn't work with, like, that's what we've got with the Reinhardt family at the moment. <laughs> it's certainly not, you know, if you, Adele Ferguson is literally facing possible custodial sentence, the writer, um, because she did venture there. Yes, sorry, uh, um, Louise. Geoffrey, just building on a couple of things that Ruth said, mm. and on your own paper, and I also thank you for your kind remarks, <laughs> but I wondered too whether part of our difficulty is that historians in some senses don't understand what business is. The general public often has a misunderstanding of what business is. <coughs> and I think particularly at this stage um, in Queensland business where there are a lot of takeovers, mergers, etc., there are also businesses that are growing very rapidly with great influxes of new people. Now, I've been involved in a couple where, in fact, the whole purpose of the historical enterprise was to explain to all these new people who had no idea how the business started, what it was about, who this person was that occasionally they hear about in the tea room. And it can make a real difference in forging an identity to a business which has lost one, which sounds contradictory. But just to get back to that other point of what actually is business history, I had occasion doing some work for someone in Townsville recently to look yet again at your own A Thousand Miles Away. Now, that book, that history of North Queensland, now many years old, I wouldn't budge an inch without it, can be read as a business history. All the elements are there. Investment, communication, seizing an opportunity, needing a market and how those things were managed along with managing both the external business environment and the physical environment that the people who were the beginners of North Queensland dealt with. And I think perhaps if you think back to the days when university undergraduates in history were taught grand sweep subjects, you could actually teach, and I think Ross Johnson might disagree with this, but you could teach the history of the British Empire as a business history. It was all about businesses but seeking yeah, opportunities in other parts of the world. It was a mercantile history. So perhaps somehow, and maybe the Business Leaders Hall of Fame and these joint enterprises is a way of adjusting people's views about what exactly business is and what exactly business history is. And to some extent, I think perhaps there's been a suffering in fashion that somehow or other business was equated with rogues, crooks and double dealers or people who endlessly exploit others without realising that in all our communities it's been a creative force. Helen, I would agree entirely that among many university graduates and I'm sorry to say probably particularly among arts graduates, there is an ignorance about how business works, and um, that has to be a bridge that has to be built. Um, I'm going to sound as if I'm being irrelevant for a moment, but last weekend, my wife and I saw a film of a national theatre play that's just come out in London called The House. 
which is an account of the minority Labour government in Britain from 1974 to 79, and thus eerily rather appropriate, um, and the way in which it scrambled to hold on to office, and most of the action takes place inside the whips room and gives a very vivid picture of the way that the parliamentary majorities are cobbled together. Um, and at the same time, it managed to be first-class drama. The playwright, James Graham, is only 30 years old. He wasn't alive when these things were happening. And one has the delight of finding a new talent. Now, I'm pretty sure that there's a second play to be written called The Boardroom, in which um, one could look at the way in which decisions are taken by a business at a moment of perhaps some crisis. And um, it would be really illuminating about the role of leadership, the amount of uncertainty there is. Um, business is not a scientific uh, process. It has calls for imagination, it calls for experience, and sometimes just for good luck. And um, maybe, you know, there's a field there to be done at the, as it were, fictional level. Or, or <clears throat> but um, I think myself that um, Perhaps if I was starting over in university again and trying to devise a common first year course, that there would be an element in a minute to introduce business methods to the knowledge, even of people who are not going to be business people, so that they are aware of what's involved in all this. One other thing, Geraldine, you mentioned Gina Hancock, and that's a real problem in this respect. But Gina and her father have constructed a mythology a pioneer mythology. Yeah. Um, I'm going to invite litigation, perhaps. <laughs> but it starts on this founding story of Lang Hancock and his aircraft finding it being yeah. driven out of its course by all these mountains of iron ore and realising for the first time that this is iron ore. Well, iron ore had been known in the Pilbara for at least 60 or 70 years, but it had been too difficult to get at until we had modern methods of transport and um, mining technology, and until we had a demand driven from industrialization after the Second World War. And tell the truth, checking the weather records, uh, I haven't found anything that endorses that account of the conditions <laughs> on the day that seems to happen. But. Um, what Gina has done, she's absorbed the pioneer myth of the doughty person hazarding drought and destruction and staking all. And the thing is that the Hancocks were not incompetent pastoralists, and there is a pioneer element in the story, but she would like this to overtake the entire narrative. Um, she would like it to be imagined that all Lang's business decisions were, were sound ones. And of course, the one sound decision he made was to make sure that the family got a percentage of everything that was found from here to eternity. Sure. Um, so it's going to be very hard to have a, uh, a good business history written in those circumstances. And I guess there are firms, not quite on such a scale as Hancock Reinhardt, which we may have to leave in the too hard basket and simply by the force of example of showing that the firms that are willing to have their records told, that um, in the end, it's beneficial to get the story straight. Yes, that's, <coughs> that's just a fascinating observation about myth breaking and the role, um, the role of history, isn't it? Really, that does, you know, I saw you talking about seeing the house, uh, which I was in London recently and just missed the house had just gone off and everybody was raving to me about it. And so, But I saw instead the audience, which is the Helen Mirren uh, play. Oh, yes. uh, the, I think I think it's Stephen Daldry, I think, wrote it. Um, and uh, again, so it's the Queen's uh, conversations with her various <laughs> prime ministers. And it's ex excellent drama. Um, and again, I was struck by the incredible British capacity to rescue their most recent history, even when it's pockmarked and, and contested, and to make drama out of it. And as, as you say, I don't, this, these young people who are writing it, they're not historians. 
I just, we don't do anything like that, I don't think. Although I did think Paper Giants, I watched that the mm. other day, it was a very, very good effort to sort of look at our recent history and to make it dramatic and u fabulous use of, of music and texture. And um, so, I mean, there is some efforts, but, you know, that, that is an area where I think, um, and equally, if you want to go, it was thinking of the discussion about the British Empire. Victoria Glendinning has written that very interesting history of Stamford Raffles, which is really mm -hmm. uh, a very a hybrid. I interviewed her recently. It's very much a hybrid um, of the British Empire and, and the East India Company and, um, and Raffles and what he became. Because I know when I actually had to do the interview, I thought, gosh, where do I go? This is such a hybrid. I'm going to have to tease it out. You know, it didn't fit into any neat little genre. So the, I, I, there is real rich pickings there for us, I think. Yes, please, sir. Um, are there any William Cadbury's in Australia? By that I mean men who to, tried to create model, uh, uh, model businesses. One I would think of would be Fletcher Jones in Warrnambool, who um, established a very successful, well, trousers it was mostly, but tailoring company where members of the staff were invited to become shareholders and where they helped to participate in the decision making. And uh, I think Australian business history could have done with a few more Fletcher Joneses. Mm. Yes. Hi, I'm Della Churchill. I work for Human. We uh, are a social enterprise that make digital stories. And I wanted to get back to that uh, archiving that you're doing over in WA. You're recording uh, stories for prosperity or when you at least had the resources and that made me wonder if you're doing that visually or just audio and also whether you've looked at uh, new technologies uh, to uh, put those online and perhaps crowdsource so it's not so expensive people who would like to volunteer to help you get those transcripts together if there's a, a use of modern technologies and social media to help you with that yeah, I believe we may be advancing that. We started on a um, conventional oral history recording basis because um, our Vice-Chancellor, with a more generosity than many Vice-Chancellors would show these days, has uh, put a, a modest but appreciable sum of money towards the project this year and last year. Um, and there is a question I won't bother you with the internal politics of it, but yes, I think that um, we have to look to these new methods of preservation and um, uh, no doubt we'll be seeking advice about that. So, but for the moment, it is mainly a collection of recordings with um, the sort of note on it saying uh, two minutes past, uh, two seconds, two minutes, um, how I came to be employed at Murdoch, um, three minutes, 52 seconds, what I thought of the Vice-Chancellor and so on and so <laughs> forth. <coughs> and those headings will enable the researcher to go back to grab the bit that she or he's interested in. Somebody else at the head. Yes, please, down here. Uh, my name's Michael Henry. I don't have any comments, but I, I do ha would like to ask you a question, uh, Professor. Uh, what what drives you to research and write about history? And secondly, what do you think is the fundamental skills needed for someone to, to, do, to do what you do? How long do you say this conference is going on? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give you some uh, short answers, Michael. Number one, I, my father wanted to be a school teacher. There wasn't the money in the house, but he did collect certain works of history and biography, and he allowed me the run of them. And I'm pretty sure that's what got me started. Um, secondly, I enjoy writing. I don't have enough imagination to be a novelist or a poet, but I do have uh, a certain abil ability to put a narrative together, and history was the obvious niche in the work. So many stories that still had to be told. It is really just being an old storyteller to the tribe. Uh, yes, sir. Beside you. Rod Wiley. Uh, the discussion so far, sir, has been focused on individual businesses and has widened a little bit to families. But the earlier mention of the Hines and the Lays made me think of other 
timber companies at the same time, and a lot of number one, like Hancock's, Wilson, Hart and Mirabra, Gills, James Campbell, there are a lot of them. And I just wonder whether there isn't an opportunity to widen the focus a little bit for, for, as far as industry histories, because the timber industry was very important to, to Queensland, the whole of Queensland in the early days, and maybe that would add also to our knowledge if, if it could be widened to that. Well, I agree with you entirely. I suppose there's a thought that we've got to get the building blocks into place before we can complete the whole edifice. On the other hand, as we saw with Blaney's rush that never ended, there's something to be said for having a good overview of the mining industry from which others can sink shafts deeper into the find where the load is. And uh, that was a metaphor. Yes, that was <laughs> our show, yes. Anyway, um, uh, if anybody felt impelled to write about the beef cattle industry or the pastoral industry, sugar, sugar cane obviously, then um, I'd be all for them having a go because although for the next 20 or 30 years people will be saying, well, Blog said so and so, but further research into the history of Gilfrogan in, in Bundaberg has revealed that, uh, well, that's all right, that's the way the history grows, that's the way we accumulate. And um, yeah, if anyone's ready to do one of those industry-wide histories, give them every encouragement. Mm. Yes, sir. Follow up on the earlier uh, questions, I think transnational history is, is another approach. Uh, uh, for example, uh, a lot of uh, Australian Chinese, uh, uh, they went back to Hong Kong, established their department store in Hong Kong, Shanghai, uh, in Singapore, London. Uh, they, there are a lot of archival materials available in Shanghai, mm. in Batman archives, in, the, uh, in, in, in different kinds of archives. So I think the transnational approach, I think, can help us to understand, I mean, the interaction between Australian and Chinese, or David Jones, or <coughs> other folks. So that would be a way to look at business history. They, there's a very interesting book recently published by Cornell University, uh, by Duke University, entitled uh, Ch uh, Ch uh, Chinese Circulation. Mm. So they try to use different kinds of objects to oh, link right. Right. Uh, to link uh, China and South Asia, uh, uh, like seagoing junks, mm. silver, uh, copper. Uh, so they could uh, I mean uh, how else on this uh, like in Australia, like gold. Now we can link Bendigo, Townsville, Air, Shanghai together. So that is that one, kind of one, circulation one, of ideas, mm -hmm. circulation of goods. Uh, I'm from University of Queensland, and uh, Ross is my boss. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, I, I'm a business historian, uh, but I'm working only on China. But uh, uh, we had uh, some kinds of business history activity under uh, Ross Johns, Johnston's uh, I mean leadership. So we had some of the business history. I mean, business history conference on Shanghai, or on Western Chan. So, like, we try to understand uh, the mentality of business. Uh, I mean, the entrepreneur. So, we try to see the connection between gam uh, gambling, risk taking behavior, and we come up with some kinds of interesting thing. But I think in teaching business history, uh, uh, Jeff is very good. To, I mean, to mention Avicenna. I think mm -hmm. Avicenna uh, has a very successful case study method in Harvard Business School. I, I went to Harvard Business School in the 1990. Uh, in there, I think they were using a lot of case studies like GE, right? Like, yeah. uh, like uh, more Standard of an appetite Oil. for that in the US than here, I think. Probably QUT or, or or UQ Business School. They could. Use that kind of method. I mean, use a very simple case that is method. I mean, uh, like Pearson, I mean, the fashion house, mm -hmm. or yeah. a couple of other. We try to write very simple, like 20 pages, I mean, case studies. And then, like Alfred Chenna, he, he, he drew on that to come uh, to edit a very big volumes about American okay. business history. So I think. Uh, That's okay. 
Right on. Okay. No, no, that's a good yeah, no, I am conscious that that's the side that in my paper I didn't explore mm. at all, and that was the overseas connections. Um, I would think particularly in Queensland, Sydney, Western Australia, the trade links with China, Japan, India go back to the first half of the 19th century even. And um, there have been one or two people who have explored that. I think of Frank Brewer, for instance. But there's not been much done systematically. And I would be quite sure that even after all the vicissitudes in Asian history that there would be materials in places like Shanghai and Tokyo which would be highly relevant to an understanding of Australian business history. Now, all I can say is important, and yes, it should be on the agenda. It's, it's immense music to my ears. I've just got, look, I really think we should, we, we're running over time and we will have time. I'm just going to take a sort of MC's licence because we can continue this next, in the next round. Why ultimately, Geoffrey, did not more young historians follow Geoffrey Blaney? If Geoffrey Blaney burst onto the scene, as you said, and offered such promise and such, you know, fame, why, didn't, why did it not happen? What's your view? Well, I think, you know, like myself, a lot of us went off to Oxford and um, went, um, as the Old Testament says, a whoring after strange gods. But, <laughs> 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 but um, uh, I, as I say, certainly among the current generation, the young, I, I detect that there's often a, a prejudice not founded on anything in particular about Going, getting involved with business and embracing the capitalists too hard. Uh, and uh, I think it's a prejudice, and I've always tried to dispel that prejudice when it can happen. But uh, certainly that deserves a bit further exploration. One other thing I'd just like to say before I break up, a um, couple of people have spoken about kindly references to them. Well, when I wrote the paper, I had no idea of who was going to be here. <laughs> I was not going to be like some uncle on the children's program giving a big cheerio to all my mates. So, uh, you must take those comments as being entirely kosher. <laughs> <laughs> Likely story. Oh, look, ladies and gentlemen, what a fabulous start. Will you please thank Professor Geoffrey Bolton? <laughs>